Tell me about your needs and your desires. Tell me about your loved ones, how they are doing and their needs. They are my loved ones too. Speak to Jesus in the blessed Sacrament, just as you would speak to your best friend. Tell him about all of your concerns, needs, your family, loved ones, friends, and neighbors. Express sorrow for your sins and those you have hurt. Ask for the grace to forgive all who have hurt you. Pray for guidance and healing. Dear friend, how are you? I just had to send a note to tell you how much I care about you. I saw you yesterday as you were talking with your friends. I waited all day hoping you would want to talk with me too. I gave you a sunset to close your day and a cool breeze to rest you. And I waited. You never came. It hurt me. But I still love you because I am your friend. I saw you sleeping last night and longed to touch your brow. So I spilled moonlight upon you, your face. Again I waited, wanting to rush down so we could talk. I have so many gifts for you. I try to tell you in blue skies and in the quiet green grass. I whispered in leaves on the trees and greeted the colors of flowers. Shouted to you in mountain streams. Give the birds love songs to sing. Clothe you with warm sunshine and perfume in the air with nature scents. My love for you is deeper than the ocean and bigger than the biggest need in your heart. Ask me. Talk with me. Please don't forget me. I have so much to share with you. I have chosen you and I will wait because I love you.
and profited by these experiences. Those who are unwilling to stand up and fight temptations will quickly fall away from them. Do not be disturbed that things are not going as you would like them to go. Look upon your trials as part of your daily life. Bear patiently with what you cannot remedy. Thus will you prove yourself a true follower of mine. Temptations may come to you at any hour of the day or night. You will meet them within yourself. Or again, you may come from the persons and things around you. No time or place is free from temptations, and every person has his share of them. Through all of this, however, I am close at hand, ready to give my heavenly strength to those who are willing to fight. In time of temptation, you have a chance to prove a more unselfish love for me. It is then that you have your best opportunity to rise above your puny self out to me.
you for joining us this evening. Um, I have been given the distinguished honor of introducing our guest speakers. Um, Thomas and Annette Palachek, they joined us in the Sacred Heart Parish in Wadsworth, Ohio. Um, many of you may know Annette. She grew up in this parish and went to St. Mary's School. And Thomas and Annette were married here a little over 51 years ago. So we are happy to welcome them back. Um, at Sacred Heart Parish, they were instrumental in bringing about perpetual adoration and were recommended to us to come and speak on it and to join us in adoration so that we could learn from their experience. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Mr. Thomas Palachek. Saying Mass 
and was having difficulties himself in believing that Jesus is truly present in the consecrated bread and wine. And as he raised the host in consecration, the host began to bleed and came down his arm. Mm -hmm. And the blood in the chalice became droplets of blood. And in the 70s, in 1970, and sometime in that, in those uh, 10 years there, they did another test. They've done many tests. And it had all the chemical properties of blood still there some 1,300 years later. You know, blood will lose its, its um, chemical properties 20 minutes or so after it uh, is in the air. So there's another um, proof of Jesus is truly present. Now, let's return to uh, the Jewish people, uh, the, the, some of the first Christians, and think about their exodus. You know, they had all these wonderful, magnificent miracles that occurred, the plagues on the Egyptians, ten major plagues, the last one being the death of the firstborn of the Egyptians, both man and beast. In fact, it was so bad that they ushered the Jewish people out of there and gave them gold, silver, jewelry, just get out of here. And a few days later, the Pharaoh changed his heart and went after them with his army. And of course, you know the story of how the Red Sea parted, the Jewish people went across, the, Red, the army came, and they were uh, covered up by the water. But guess what? About three months later, the Jewish people are worshiping a golden cat. How does that happen? And if you look through their salvation history, they are with God, they are not with God. You know, he tells them, I'm going to send you into the land of Canaan. Go and take that land. And they said, you know, we can't take that land. They had sent out some spies. And they said, we can't take it. They're too big. They have too much armament. And you know what God did? He said, made them wander in the desert for 40 years. So it's tough. It's tough to stay close. I feel that one of the biggest problems they had was they didn't have the Eucharist. We have the Eucharist. You know, as, huh, that's the one thing that we do have that strengthens us. We know that the Blessed Sacrament is the source of grace and love. And Jesus wants us to do more than just go to Mass on Sunday. He wants us to adore Him. He wants us to love Him. He wants us to talk to Him and ask him for help, and help for others. We had the reading of the Matthew Gospel, uh, 26, and he says, could you not watch one hour with me? These were his apostles. He waits for you to visit him. In the Divine Mercy devotion, which some of you may know of, Jesus said to St. Faustina, the Blessed Sacrament is the throne of mercy on earth. He wants us to daily adore him in the Blessed Sacrament. His heart, which is full of mercy. He said, I want adoration to take place for the intention of imploring mercy for the whole world. Now, I'm a cradle Catholic. I went to grade school to, with the Immaculate Heart of Mary nuns in Long Island, New York. I went to a Jesuit high school in Brooklyn, New York. And I went to St. Francis, I had the Franciscans in, so I've gotten a whole bit, and that's where I met my wonderful wife. And so Annette and I have always been Catholic. We've always gone to church. We've always been involved in what's going on. But quite frankly, in 1986, I had an epiphany. I was visited by my Aunt Peg and Uncle Ed, who had retired from Philadelphia out to Tucson. And Aunt Peg, I was really close to her. I used to call her my occasion of sin because every time she visited me when I was a kid, she would tell me to do something that my parents didn't want me to do. I remember one of them. She told me to go get a crew cut. My mother was livid over this. <laughs> my Aunt Peg was just a great gal, just a wonderful gal. And she comes to our home to visit. This is around 86. And uh, we're in the living room, and she says to me, you know, she's appearing in Medjugorje uh, every day. I said, who? She said, Mary. I said, oh. She says, no, she's appearing. I said, get out of here. She takes this magazine article out of her purse, and she says, here, read it. I read this thing, and I said, wow, yeah, she's real, and she's one of us. And this really started me on a progression in which I guess I've read virtually every book on Marian apparitions 
there's probably a few I haven't. Beginning with the one, the very first apparition, they call it an apparition, of uh, St. James in Saragossa, Spain. And I'm not sure whether it's a bilocation or an apparition because they're really not sure when Mary was assumed into heaven. And of course, Fatima was a tremendous one, and there's many. But, you know, Mary says in almost every apparition, pray the rosary daily. Pray the rosary. We'll get into that in a minute. But now I'm on the expressway to Jesus because that's what Mary does. You go to her, she puts you on that railroad car, and you're running right to Jesus. And it's amazing how she and the Holy Spirit took me on this uh, journey. Because the next thing you know, I'm saying the rosary every day. I become involved in reading about divine mercy. What's divine mercy? I've even had uh, some priests back in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. Gee, I've got to read about what Tom is talking about, this divine mercy. And uh, I got involved with reading the book on Mary Movement of Priests. And uh, I became, I decided that I really wanted to become the spiritual director of our pastoral council. And uh, I brought in Marian speakers. Uh, one was a great one, uh, Bud McFarland from New Jersey, just a terrific guy. We started prayer groups. Uh, and I really wanted us to get into perpetual adoration. And to show you how the Holy Spirit works and God works, just so happened that in the early 90s, we decided that Sacred Heart was going to build an addition on its church. We had started with a cruciform, uh, and we had a west nave, and we were going to finish it with an east nave. And the rumblings came up that the tabernacle was going to be moved from the altar to the vestibule of this new east nave. And there were many people who were very upset about this, and we got to talking about it, and it was a big meeting. And some of us decided, well, gee, maybe we could get a chapel built between the, the cruciform, this little area down here, and we could put the tabernacle in there, and maybe that would solve the bad feelings. And uh, the pastor at that time said, yeah, I think we could do that. And, and we got some people who said they would donate the money. It wouldn't have to come out of the building fund for this East Nave. And um, it sounded like that would be pretty good. And I said, you know, this would be a good idea to get a big painting of the Divine Mercy and call the chapel the Chapel of the Divine Mercy. And um, um, our pastor said, yeah, that would be fine, but I want to call it the Chapel of the Blessed Sacrament. That's not a bad name. How could I argue with that? But I said, Father, I said, why don't you on a Friday, I said to him, here, take this cassette tape. It was by Father McGinnity. And I said, listen to this tape over the weekend. And if on Monday when I call you, if you still want to call it the Chapel of the Blessed Sacrament, that's okay. When I called him on Monday, he said, Tom, we're going to call the Chapel of the Divine Mercy. And we got a 4 by 8 painting, which is on the back of the wall, if you've ever been there. And our tabernacle went there, and above the tabernacle was the monstrance, because we were going to start perpetual adoration. Um, and this uh, 4 by 8 painting really is amazing. And it's uh, Jesus of the Divine Mercy with the red and pale rays emanating from his heart area. And says, Jesus, I trust in you. And... Uh, we opened that chapel in, um, actually we kind of opened in early, uh, late 94, but we really got it going in January of 1995. Uh, the artist was from Rhode Island, and I took a, uh, a van and went to Rhode Island and picked up this 4 by 8 painting. Uh, and we started a prayer group on January 8th that year, uh, a Marian prayer group, and we started perpetual adoration on All Saints Day in 1995. So we've been going about 17 years. Um, we're the smallest, or at least at that time, we were the smallest parish in the diocese to have perpetual adoration. <laughs> now, what are the fruits of perpetual adoration? Well, healing prayers are answered. We have a booklet in our chapel. And the booklet has people writing in prayers for everybody to pray about. Uh, my husband's having an operation. My son lost his job. It's needs one. Whatever. There's a little uh, uh, bulletin board for pictures of soldiers who were in Iraq or in Afghanistan. And then there's also people who write in, thank you for the answer to this prayer. Thank you for this healing. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. It's just amazing the miracles that are occurring as a result of this devotion. We also have had vocations to the priesthood. We have three now. 
who are going to become priests, and we had one who uh, went to the diaconate. So it's strengthening families, it's providing us with uh, vocations. And I wanted to tell you that, uh, you know, Mother Teresa and her Sisters of Charity, she said we were floundering for applicants for many years. We just were not getting people to, uh, or ladies to join until we went to daily adoration. And then we started to get all sorts of applicants. <clears throat> and I wanted to tell you one other thing. You know, the, the big four by eight painting of the Divine Mercy, Jesus, his eyes will look at you, whether you're way over in the left, way over in the right, right in the center, his eyes are always looking at you. Pretty neat. Well, about four years after we started, Father Malaba uh, became the pastor, Father Conrad had retired. And he said, Tom, can we get a couple of other paintings? He said, I want to get one of St. Faustina, and I want to get one of Mary. Mm -hmm. And we did. I got the artist to paint those. And uh, uh, they're only about two, two and a half by three feet. And we put them up on either sides uh, of the chapel. Now, the eyes of St. Faustina look straight ahead, just like any painting. But Mary's eyes follow you wherever you go in that chapel. You can be almost up right against it, and her eyes are looking at you. It's really kind of fascinating. I had a grandson who came in one time to join us, and I told him about it. He said, can you walk over here? Can you walk over here? He says, no way. I know. Perpetual adoration. You're going to tell me, I don't have the time. i got to work. i got to go here. i got to go there. So let's review a few things. Let's review the agony we heard about in the gospel today. Jesus. He sweats blood because he knows all that he has to go through. He knows all the sins before, during, and after this. And he knows all the souls that he's going to lose who are just not going to change. And yet he goes ahead and does this. But I know you don't have the time to take one hour, one hour, and a day in the blessed Savior. And then what happens? Jesus is scourged at the pillar. You know, the Romans were just brutal in what they did. And the whip that they used for scourging him had little metal pieces on the end and tore his flesh off. And not only on his back, but on his front. But I know, you're tired, you can't do it, you can't take it. one little hour to go and to learn the whole society. And then what happens? They crown him with thorns. I don't know, like a little splinter in my finger. Three of those were mortal wounds. And he had to endure that crown of thorns. Thank you for finding the time. And then the crucifixion. He carries his cross. He's nailed to the cross. And he hangs on the cross. Now, most people think he hung on the cross for over three hours. But if you read Mark's gospel, he said he was crucified at 9 o'clock in the morning died at three. I'm not saying that there's errors in the gospel, but there's a little dispute as to whether he was on for six hours or nine or three hours. But if he was on for six and he hung on that cross for six hours, you mean I can't find some time to go and see him and thank him for all he did? And if you want to read about the blows that he received during his passion, pick up a Pieta on page 28 and you'll find out the number of blows he had. So don't be afraid. Many doors start with one hour, and then they want a second and a third hour. Or maybe they just come in for five minutes, for ten minutes, and they'll add other hours. I picked when we started a three o'clock hour on Sunday afternoon, and the reason I picked that three o'clock hour is because it's the hour of the great mercy that was told to us by St. Faustina in her diary. And I'm amazed at the number of people who come in for five minutes, ten minutes, and they come for two or three weeks, same time, three o'clock in the afternoon, and I don't see them for a while, and then I do see them. People are coming to adore our God. Jesus told St. Faustina, I want adoration to take place for the intention of imploring mercy for the whole world. You can come to me at any moment, Remember the three o'clock hour, because it's the most powerful hour of the day. It's the day when it's the time when Jesus died. And he said in this diary to St. Faustina, 
Uh, it, ask me anything. If it's within my Father's will, I will grant it to you. Try to step into the chapel just for a few minutes and think of me on the cross at that 3 o'clock hour. We live in what was once a wonderful, wonderful Christian country. Unfortunately, we are slowly losing our soul. We, as well as our government, have lost our way. Mary has said, if all the Catholics in the world practice their faith, all the world will be Catholic. We Catholics have all the chapters in the book. We have all the tools. We have the Mass, the Eucharist, we have confession, we have adoration, and we have the weapon, as Padre Pio calls it. The weapon, the rosary. And we need to pray to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament to remoralize America, to return us to our Christian roots, and we can't do it without God. And we need to pray that rosary daily. And I will pray for St. Mary's that you can begin perpetual adoration. And I want to just recall one other thing, 2 Chronicles 7.14. God's promise to Solomon, if my people humble themselves and pray and seek my presence and turn from their evil ways, I will hear them from heaven and pardon their sins and I will revive the land. When St. Faustina was praying before Jesus in the Holy Eucharist, he showed her a vision. She said, each time a person entered the chapel and visited Jesus, exposed in the monasteries, she saw his divine rays of love and mercy <coughs> burst forth and encircle the whole world and everyone in it with graces and blessings. You're in our prayers. You both can do this. God bless you. Thank you. I will answer some questions. chapel is locked from the inside okay. and the only way you can get in is somebody inside has to open it up but that's a great question because there are many ladies who are concerned about that maybe even some men uh, at one two three o'clock in the morning and we have a next door neighbor who has indicated that some people have tried to come in uh, so yes you have to be cautious about that but we really haven't had any problems during the daytime it's kind of interesting you do get some people who come in I remember our deacon was telling us, uh, he was showing, I guess it was through the Ministerial Association, they go around and look at the different churches, and he was bringing the Protestant ministers into the church, and he was showing them our chapel, and of course there was people in there, and he said, yeah, yeah, what, I think one of them said, well, you know, what are they doing? He said, well, we're adoring the Eucharist, uh, and we do that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. That guy was just amazed, amazed that we do that. Anything else? Awesome. Tom? Yes, well, could, you, could you share with us, were there any other foundational <laughs> steps that the parish took in terms of preparing the parish at large beyond saying we need to make sure that every hour is covered? Well, uh, Father, uh, a couple things. Uh, I gave to Tara. <laughs> four or five brochures on how to set it up, that's number one. When we decided to do this, it was a group of us who wanted to do it, who were very committed to it. And the first we got uh, the pastor's approval that we could try to do this. Uh, we went to the pastoral council and talked to them and said we would like to try to do this, give us your blessing, they gave us a blessing. We put together a team and we had somebody from the diocese, and it was a lay person, I don't remember what his name was, but he came and talked at all the masses. We had sign-up slips for people to do that. And uh, we broke up the day into four quarters. Uh, let's say 6 a.m. to noon, noon to 6 p.m., 6 p.m. to midnight, midnight to 6 a.m. And we had somebody in charge of each of those six-hour periods. And we had hourly captains for each hour. And of course, the sign-up sheets and sign-up sheets and sign-up sheets. Um, I can't remember now when we started to do it, but I do know that we opened on All Saints Day. Uh, did we have trouble filling the hours? 
Um, I would say not at the beginning. Uh, at times you'll go through a period where you're missing people, but that's why you have to have a sub list. And from time to time, in fact, I just talked uh, three or four months ago, I think, to the parish about we were having trouble filling sometimes between midnight and 6 a.m. And uh, so I gave a talk at all the, the masses on Sunday. We had over 40 people who signed up. If, if you talk to them, you tell them what it's about, you'll be able to do it. There, there will be times where you'll have an hour that you're having a tough time to fill. But the parish prays about it, uh, and you'll find someone will step forward and do it. There are some times when people miss hours. I've missed them. Um, you forget. It's not because necessarily you're away. Uh, maybe you're doing something else. Uh, we have a, a, Annette and I have a holy hour on Mondays at 6 o'clock. When Monday's a holiday, we got to really charge us with, hey, we have a 6 o'clock in the evening holy hour that we have to go to because you're doing other things that day. But if your hourly captains are on top of things, yes, and everybody gets behind you, starting right from the past or all the way down, and those sign-up sheets have to be available all the time. And then in the, in the chapel itself, you have a booklet where people sign in when they come in for that hour. Even if they're going to stay 15 minutes, we tell them to sign up. They don't always do that. Because we want to know who's coming, who's coming in. And um, uh, it's been pretty good. I, you know, we're not a huge parish. Uh, we're about the same size as St. Mary's. Uh, but we have some dedicated people who have you know, gone out to find. And there are some people who say, I'll take your hour. I'll take your hour. I mean, you can always call on somebody. I have some people who take my hours when Annette and I go away, and uh, you know, it seems like I can ask them every time. Oh yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it. Uh, it's really tremendous. Uh, yes. Um, I used to live in Barberton. I was a member of Sandusky, oh, and yes. we had oh, where they still did. Absolutely. Yes. But there wasn't a chapel per se. It was, just it was done in the church. church. And it's still that way. And I'm thinking that we don't have a chapel. Do we? Well, you have a little spot behind the uh, altar. Uh, you'll, you'll work that out where it's going to be. But yeah, St. Augustine has it in the church. And the problems that you have with that are the locked doors and control that way because you want people to be safe. You want them to feel safe. And uh, we have in our little entrance way into the chapel from outside a books that uh, you know they can read, uh, prayers that they can say, uh, the things that we had tonight to use. This little uh, pamphlet which we uh, uh, put out, this came from Medjugorje. It's just beautiful, really. And uh, you'll enjoy that. Anything else? Father, did I answer your question? Oh, you. I mean, you answered based on your experience. I, yeah. I you know, I've heard of some different approach where, uh, like a mission, a mission with the the focus of perpetual adoration has been brought into a parish. Sure, and that would be um, good too. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know, uh, what you really have to do is let them know so that they have an opportunity to sign up. I mean, while I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like, I certainly wouldn't take a stance like, well, until every single parish parishioner in St. Mary knows what it is, uh, then we won't do it. But I think one of the, one of the challenges I, I feel is um, we're at a point where many of our people, in the classic sense of the word, are ignorant. They they just have no evidence. I mean, the evidence suggests they have no inkling whatsoever as to what it's about. Mm -hmm. And I had an experience several weeks ago where we began a period of adoration. It was uh, to coincide with uh, the weekend of Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'd even made an announcement about we were going to end this way and quiet. And it was people helped. Well, I, mean, I didn't tell you that um, when I was on that expressway from Mary, and I got involved with Divine Mercy, um, we started celebrating the Feast of Divine Mercy, I think at least eight years before uh, Pope John Paul II made it a regular feast. We would hold it on, uh, we start the novena from uh, Good Friday to Mercy Sunday, 
and we would get people to come in and pray the Chaplet of Divine Mercy with us. So we were doing a lot of things. We had the Marian Prayer Group, which had started uh, in the chapel. So there were a lot of things going on in the parish. Um, you know, uh, Divine Mercy is just a fabulous de devotion. Um, you can remember it by Finch, you know, the bird Finch. First is the feast, the second is the, the eye is the image, the end is the novena, the C is the chaplet of divine mercy, and H is the power of mercy. So I think some of those things contributed to that, that people were getting aware. And of course, the chapel did help because it was so prominent. Um, our tabernacle is not there anymore. It's back up on the altar, which quite frankly, when we were going to move it, I remember going to our pastor and say, Father, is this okay that we really do this? Because I didn't want to take it off the altar. And he said, yes, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. But now it's back and, and the major portion of the church. So yes, you got to work hard. It, it took a while. I mean, I don't think we did it overnight. Uh, Annette might have a better memory than me. I don't really remember when we started. It seems to me like we started in the spring. Uh, you know, we, we probably had six months of getting ready for this, but all same stays when we started. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I just have a comment. Uh, when they do it in the middle of the night, you don't have to do it then, but I do mine at 3.30 in the morning because I love being in here, my sister and I, but I've been in here alone and she's sick. I, I love being here in the middle of the night. Nobody around is buying your cheese and all mine. <laughs> you know, I don't mind that, that selfish little part of me. But I love it, and I'm never afraid. I have never been afraid. And it's taught me, you know, you see somebody out at night that way, you think, what are they doing? <laughs> but it taught me, you know, if somebody comes up on me on the street and they're going to grab me, sure, I'll be afraid for a minute. But really, when I see people out at night, when I'm coming in, they're leaving bars or whatever, it doesn't bother me. I just, I love it. But any time is good. I do it during the week, too, in my life. But I really like it. Nobody's there because I can. You know, it, it, oh, my. I can tell you that people do get very protective of their hour. <laughs> Why are you even coming in here? This is my hour, you know? <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Um, how many years ago? I think it was two years ago. Bernie and I, we like you when we try to like to see shrines, among a whole bunch of other things. And we were in Stark, British, Massachusetts. Uh -huh. Not even knowing what the divine mercy was. Oh my goodness, it was absolutely beautiful. And we picked up the literature, but I had never heard of the divine mercy. But I kept the literature. So last year, when we had the Divine Mercy Sisters, it was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. This is so anyhow, Bernie and I say the Divine Mercy every day, the Novena. And uh, Lord willing, you know, oh, that, because America, the whole world, is in dire need of God's Divine Mercy as never before. Yes. And it is for His glory and honor if we are to convert souls. If souls are to be converted into him. And so. Yeah, I was talking with one of the ladies, Mary, who was, uh, who was here tonight earlier. Uh, and um, she was talking about uh, her children, or perhaps her sister's children, I think it was. And, um, you know, place them in Mary's arms. Place them before Jesus, and he'll take care of them. He knows the right time to just put those little thoughts in their mind that they should do this or do that. And pray the rosary every day. You know, um, we all know about the nine First Fridays from um, St. Margaret Mary and Uh But do you know of the five First Saturdays and how those are to be communions of reparations that we are to say? Do we go to Mass, Confession, say the rosary? So there's so many tools that we have. And if the parish gets together and says, you know, let's pray about perpetual adoration, I think that expressway of Mary will take care of it. Right? <laughs> Shouldn't be any problem. Anybody else? Any questions? Yes, ma'am. This is changing the subject for a few minutes. But That's okay. I get paid the same amount, whether it's. <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to know if that, that Mass that you that was given to 
Lucia, has that ever, ever been revealed, or will it ever be, or is that just dead? You know, I don't know. I, I you know, I've read some stories about it. I, I don't know whether it's been revealed or not. Uh, the same way as uh, the question about whether uh, Russia has been consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Uh, there's still some dispute that uh, that wasn't done the way God wanted it done, and the way Mary asked for it to be done. But, you know, I don't know. I don't know whether we'll ever get an answer on that. That always comes to my mind, and I just wonder if that will ever be revealed. Yeah. I didn't tell you, you know, there are, uh, there are besides Lanciano, you know, there's other miracles of the Eucharist that are going on right now. Many. Um, there was one in Catania, Venezuela in 1995. Uh, you had Audrey Santo up in Boston. Um, that was amazing, amazing. This was a three-year-old girl that fell into the pool and was in a coma. Uh, the mother, they said, you know, put her in a home. No way. The mother said, I'm bringing this child home. This is my child. Uh, people came in, they left statues at the house, the statues started to ooze oil, they decided to have some masses there, uh, they had a tabernacle in the house, mm -hmm. they opened the tabernacle one morning and there was nothing but blood on the, uh, the bottom of the tabernacle, they were saying a mass and it was being videotaped, and guess what, they had a miracle of the Eucharist, you can see the priest going, he has the host in the pattern and it's bleeding. The guy in Batania, which is amazing, there's a guy, he's got to be from New Jersey, I could tell by the accent, as I'm uh, an Easterner. And uh, he's videotaping this mass. And just as the host is consecrated, the priest puts it back down, it starts to bleed, and he has got this camera, and he goes, oh my, you know, and he almost loses it, really, right there, videotaping this miracle of the Eucharist. Amazing. Anybody else? Isn't that little girl still in coma? I believe she's died. Oh, I, she did. I do believe. In the last few years, I don't remember I, I exactly when, but she Maybe somebody <laughs> else might know. Hmm. I think she has passed away. Okay. Thanks for the update. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed being here.